being here uh, today. And uh, it's an honor for me to welcome you all here to George Mason University. As you all know, I'm Greg Washington. <laughs> I'm your president. And uh, we're here to, uh, we're, we are here to welcome a great friend to the Mason community, Congressman Jerry Connolly. And he brings a special guest, the director of the Office of Personnel Management, Karen Ahuja. And we also have Representative Don Byer here, all three today. So you're getting a power pack panel of individuals. You know, for us, this is a great opportunity uh, for you all as students. And the reality here is that we need as many opportunities relative to experiential learning as possible. What you're doing today is a part of that experiential learning piece and what they're gonna to talk to you all about relative to internships, relative to engagement with the federal government and the state government is a part of that as well. Congressman Connolly is in his seventh term and represents the 11th district, which includes uh, Fairfax County, Prince William County, and the city of Fairfax, including George Mason University. Prior to his election to Congress, he served 13 years on the Fairfax County okay. Board of Supervisors, including five years as chairman. During his time in Congress, Congressman Connolly was exceptionally responsive to the needs of Mason. Currently, he is working with us on two very important initiatives. One is the establishment of a Virginia Climate Center, which will provide products and services to local decision makers mitigate on mitigating the effects of climate change. We've had similar sessions like this on climate here at George Mason with Congressman Connolly. The other is a learning laboratory for social and population health to improve healthcare for communities and to ensure students have improved competencies upon graduation in this space. Without Congressman Connolly, none of these would have happened. Congressman Connolly chairs the Subcommittee on Government Operations <clears throat> of the Oversight and Government Reform Committee and has been improving the performance of the federal government in almost all areas. As an example, several years ago, Congressman Connolly co-authored the Bipartisan Federal Information Technology Acquisition Reform Act, the TARA, the first major overhaul in several years of federal laws governing IT management. He has also been a leader in securing federal dollars for transportation improvements in Northern Virginia, the completion of the Fairfax County Parkway, which is ideal for us, the widening of the Prince uh, William County Parkway, providing ongoing support for rail to Dallas, and securing annual federal commitment of $150 million for the regional metro system. Congressman Connolly also serves on the House Committee of Foreign Affairs and has become a leading vote promoting, a leading voice promoting democracy and human rights across the world. Now let me highlight some of the accomplishments of our other guest. Karen Hoosier, the Director of Public, the Director of Personnel Management uh, was nominated by President Joe Biden and subsequently confirmed by the Senate on June 22, 2021. Director Hoja started her career as an attorney for the Department of Justice and later spent <clears throat> years as Barack, as Barack Obama's Executive Director of the White House Initiative on Asian American and Pacific Islanders. She is the first Asian American woman to head OPM. Director Ahuja served as OPM's Chief of Staff from 2015 to 2017 and brings a deep knowledge and commitment to OPM's mission and expertise in human capital. Perhaps most important, Director Ahuja 
has demonstrated a strong record of accomplishment of bringing people together to solve tough problems. Congressman Don Beyer is serving his fourth term as the U.S. Representative from Virginia's 8th District, representing Arlington, Alexandria, Falls Church, and parts of Fairfax County. He represents Mason's Arlington campus and has also been a tremendous friend to the university. He serves as the chairman of Congress's Joint Economic Committee and also serves on the House Committee on Ways and Means and on the House Committee of Science, Space, and Technology, where he chairs the Space Subcommittee. He has been a leader with Representative Connolly on climate change issues and co chairs of, <clears throat> and he's co chair of the New Democratic Coalition's Climate Change Task Force. He was a Lieutenant Governor of, Virginia's, of Virginia from 1990 to 1998 and was ambassador to Switzerland and Liechtenstein under Pre President Obama. Representative Bayer's signature work as Lieutenant Governor included advocacy for Virginians with disabilities and ensuring protections for Virginia's most vulnerable populations. I am so very pleased that all of you are here today. Again, welcome. Let's get on with the show. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Mr. President. And uh, we're so delighted to be here. And thank you for that warm welcome. Uh, we have a long, strong relationship with George Mason University. Um, and uh, it's, uh, you know, we want George Mason to be the place of excellence to go in Northern Virginia for technology, for leadership for the environment uh, and for community involvement. Um, I was involved uh, along with a guest we have here today, Supervisor James Walkinshaw, who also represents George Mason University on the County Board of Supervisors. James was my chief of staff and one day we were noodling about how do we get student votes to you know, tick up? And we decided, well, what if we made George Mason its own precinct? You know, students could roll out of bed in their jammies and vote. Um, and uh, so we did. We got it done. And, uh, you know, in the first few years, it was still kind of low turnout. But now, you know, we routinely get 12, 1400 students voting in this precinct. Um, and uh, we want to make sure it gets more. So thank you, James, for making George Mason University its own precinct. Give him a warm. <laughs> thank you. Um, I also had the privilege of sometimes co-teaching a course here with my predecessor, Republican member of Congress, Tom Davis, uh, who was, uh, I think he's still the rector, isn't he, Bill? And Bill Womack was uh, his uh, aide de camp and uh, often helped us. So Bill, welcome uh, on the Republican side of our subcommittee. Um, today, we wanna cover six topics um, that we think are very relevant and the last one we want to make sure we get to, which is how do you intern for intern for the federal government? Uh, and how can we make that experience better? And how can you access it? And how can we cement that partnership with George Mason University and the federal government? And the portal for all of that is the Office of Personnel Management, OPM, which is headed by Kieran Ahuja. So we're so delighted to have her. And we're so delighted to have my friend and colleague of many years, Don Beyer, uh, who represents my neighboring uh, jurisdiction and represents the law school in Arlington, which he, I hope, will get renamed. Um, anyway, <laughs> uh, Scalia Ginsburg has a nice ring to it. What mm. do you think? <laughs> um, so anyway, uh, but that's a different subject. Uh, so let's see. Uh, the first subject today we want to talk about uh, well, actually, Kieran, you may want to you might, might want to have some opening remarks just from your point of view before we get onto our yeah, sixth sure. topic. Thank you. Um, it's great to be here, uh, and thank you very much, President Washington, and uh, <coughs> lovely to be on the George Mason uh, University campus. It's great also to be with 
both of you, Gentleman Chairman Connolly and Representative Beyer. Uh, I, uh, I'm glad we're talking about what it, uh, uh, the experience or the interest in coming into the federal government. Uh, it was one of the first places I landed um, after I finished law school. And uh, I really wanted to, I know it's the cliche of change the world and have an impact, but um, uh, that is truly how I felt. And to have the experience of coming in to be a civil rights lawyer in the Department of Justice was an incredible experience. Um, I came through a kind of honors program, development program that was about, you know, training lawyers to come in and um, right out of law school. And I got to work on uh, some of the longstanding desegregation cases in the South. So I almost took like a full circle back home because I grew up in Savannah, Georgia. I don't know if there are any Georgians in here. I also lived in Virginia, by the way. Um, but, uh, and I, um, when I was in high school, my school district was under a desegregation order. And I was bused from one side of the city to the next. And so the year I graduated was the year the school came out from under its desegregation order. And then lo and behold, going to college and law school and coming back around and working on those same cases um, in which I had actually been a student kind of experiencing what that was like and really feeling like I have, you know, I had an impact. Um, and so, you know, we're here today to talk to you about um, all the ways that you can have a huge impact, that you can um, have the kind of influence. I know I cared about as much as you all about being a part of mission-driven organizations. Um, I'd be curious how many folks are thinking or contemplating federal government as a possibility. <laughs> I'm glad you guys are still thinking yeah. about it, actually. <clears throat> So, yeah, I mean, I think, you know, and nowadays in the height of the pandemic, we have seen how um, so many individuals have shown up um, and shown real courage and commitment. And that includes um, members and employees of the federal government who've been working on a vaccine, who've been ensuring that we're taking care of people who've been impacted, rental assistance, benefits, childcare tax credits. I mean, all the things that you hear about if you care about these policy issues there are federal employees behind all this work. Um, so I'm just excited to be here and look forward to the conversation. Thank you, Karen. Um, and Don, I don't know if you wanna. Just, just very briefly, I wanna know what percentage of the vote you get in this precinct. Well. Just, just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I'm thrilled Let's to be here. Let's just say these students know what they're doing. <laughs> <laughs> Three of my four grandparents were career public servants, as was my father. My mother was for a few years before she had the six children. And uh, I have enjoyed my three different roles in federal service. My wife is a federal employee and hopes to be once again. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I deeply believe that the quality of our lives is driven by the quality of our government. That virtually everything that we're dependent on from defense to justice, to the environment, housing, on and on, uh, is relying on really talented, committed federal employees to, to make happen. Uh, and they're doing, every year they do more with less. The ratio of federal employees to total US citizens is the lowest it's been in, even in our lifetimes. Yeah. Um, it just keeps getting uh, better and better. We have to attract the very best and brightest to do this. Which, so I'm so glad that um, Director Ohuha is in, in the, the role. So uh, by the way, um, I find it the most fulfilling career it's not the highest paid. You can go, you know, do do uh, be a bond trader or do venture capital or something, but you won't find nearly as much joy or happiness or fulfillment doing that. And you can get paid well in the yeah. federal government. Yeah. yeah. On certain critical positions. That's going to be my tagline. <laughs> <laughs> there are different kinds of reasons. Yeah, exactly. Congress is not one of them. <laughs> uh, but so we're kind of already into topic number one which is the importance of public service. And I think uh, Karen already touched on it. We're in a pandemic. Uh, and by the way, I'm, I've had my booster shot and I will wear my mask, but when I'm speaking, I hope you'll accept, I, I can't be heard. So <laughs> I'm gonna take it off to speak, but put it back on when other than speaking. Um, and thank you all for wearing a mask. Um, we have seen the ability of the federal government to do good things in our life. Anyone use the internet? 
the internet was 100% yeah. developed by a federal research and development program. 100%. It was done for DARPA, which was the Defense Advanced Research Project Agency. And it was run as a defense network for a number of years. But somebody saw the commercial applicability. 100% federally funded. Changed the world. All of us use it a gazillion times a day. We can't imagine life without it. Federal investment. GPS. Uh, we take it for granted, right? If you're driving, you plug in your, your uh, coordinates and it takes you where you need to go. And sometimes there's a pleasant British voice saying, turn left in 3.2 miles. Um, and you can't get lost anymore, which for Don and me, this is a problem. We can't lie about why we're late. <laughs> in the old days, you could say, well, we got lost. Not anymore. GPS, 100% federally funded R&D project. The Human Genome Mapping Project where we are, you know, we've succeeded in, in mapping the entire human genome is going to transform medicine. All of those with federal investments entirely, no private sector investment, by dedicated public servants who work for the federal government. In the pandemic, we've seen heroic acts by the federal government employees to make things work. And remarkably, they did. And uh, you know, I can tell you, as, and Don could too, I'm sure, in terms of casework, you know, Social Security, IRS, ben Veterans Administration, benefits continue to flow. Problems get unsolved. Has it been a little bit um, of a challenge in a pandemic? Yes. But we've also learned that by deploying technology, we can also work remotely as a federal workforce just like the private sector, and it's been very successful. Um, and so uh, I, think, I think the federal government deserves a lot of credit that it doesn't often get with very dedicated employees. Now, here's the challenge. A third of the federal workforce, at least, is eligible for retirement. 2.1 million people, a third of them are eligible for retirement. And only 8% of the federal workforce currently is under the age of 30. In the private sector, it's more like 28%. So we're not attracting the young talent we need to be attracting. And we are facing a huge bulge in retirement that has to be replaced. Um, and so there's a huge opportunity to do this right. And that's going to be the great challenge I think Kieran is going to be facing uh, as the new director of the Office of Personnel Management. Um, so, and, and we talked about the benefits, obviously, but one of the benefits, and Don touched on it, and I can tell you, it's a passion for me. I could be making a lot more money. I love what I do. I love public service. I love serving the public and making things better, um, trying to solve problems. Um, and that's an opportunity in big and little ways that we all can enjoy and experience in public service, especially in the federal workforce. Karen, you may, you may want to talk, Karen, about uh, both uh, the challenges and the accomplishments during this time period and some of the benefits sure. that accrue to people. Sure, I'll, um, I'll oblige. I appreciate the, the rules of engagement here on the top with the masks and no masks. I'll, I'll do the same just so you can hear me a little bit better. Um, you know, I just uh, double down on what Chairman Connolly mentioned uh, that uh, there are just amazing work that's happening, um, both in what has happened and how we're showing up during the pandemic. I would say our challenges, um, and probably you know doesn't um, doesn't work well with a um, with a, a, I would say a younger generation that is completely tied to social media in a lot of ways, is that we don't toot our own horn. We have our heads down. We're doing the work. I mean, I think sometimes we forget about you know, talking about the kind of work that we do. Um, I want to tell you a little bit about when I came in during the Obama administration and I was asked to run the White House Initiative on Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders. Um, you know, one thing I would, you know, we were working across a lot of different agencies doing some really interesting work. We were pulling people um, as what we call details from different agencies to come work um, for our initiative. One thing I would tell people that we were trying to bring in from the outside. So I come from an advocacy background. I was an advocate um, for many years. Um, and my, my appeal to them was that 
you can be an advocate inside government. Isn't that what it's really all about? If you think about these gentlemen on the Hill, I mean, that's what you're doing 24 seven. And so to have that kind of mindset because you're constantly negotiating with your peers on a particular policy, you're working on regs, you're getting into you know some of the really, really nitty gritty details and you are like, you know, um, uh, kind of satiating that intellectual kind of curiosity and wanting to dive into certain issues and, and build your expertise. But what I would say to a lot of individuals who were in a space where they wanted to drive real change, that you actually can do it inside government. And sometimes, in fact, you're having more of an impact because you know how the system works. You know how things are done. You know how laws are made. You know how regulations are put together. Um, and I think it makes a huge difference to have individuals who have such an array of experiences and bring the experiences of their communities into the federal government because those perspectives are important. We're gonna talk about a range of problems. And if I have people around the table that look exactly like each other, we're not gonna bring those experiences. So I would just say that both, you know, your orientation of where you think you can have real impact, where you can have influence, um, and certainly you can do it in a lot of sectors, but I think in many ways, um, you know, our appeal to you all today and what we'll be doing, I think for months to come, is that the federal government actually is a great place and a very cool place to work. I will say also, and we're gonna talk about this shortly, are all the benefits um, that you can get from being um, a part of the federal government. And let me just put this out as we get into that next piece, which is, you know, what I love about the history of the federal government and how it was set up is that it was the pathway to the middle class for a lot of communities. Talk about a well-paying job with benefits, with retirement. For many communities, that wasn't possible. And the federal <coughs> government really <coughs> created that pathway. Um, so, you know, I know Chairman Connolly, we're gonna talk about that a little bit, but that's how I think about the work in the federal government and how it's so impactful. Yep. And, and one of the things we, you know, not to put too dramatic a, a point on it, but sometimes federal employees find themselves in life and death situations. Uh, you know, recovery and relief efforts after a major natural disaster, for example. Those are federal employees. Uh, at FEMA, uh, or, or even federal firefighters who are trying to put out wildfires in the West, putting their lives on the line to try to get it under control. Um, I just, of course, experienced it in the Afghan ev evacuation after Kabul fell. My office alone submitted the names of 20,000 Afghanis to be evacuated. All of that had to go through the State Department. All of that had, but we were in touch with federal employees on the ground at Kabul airport trying to get this person out or, and onto one airplane and out of the country. Uh, and they were putting their lives at risk to try to make that happen. And as you know, 124,000 people, in fact, were successfully evacuated. And there are subsequent flights going on now. So uh, sometimes we have the opportunity to step in and do something really heroic at our own risk uh, as, as public servants, um, but it can make a real difference in other people's lives. Don, did you want to come? Yeah, just briefly. I know Kieran's going to talk about some of the bigger benefits just in a minute, but some of the subtler ones are when you're a federal employee, there is a very clear career path. You get not just job reviews every year, but step increases. And so you can start at a GS-5 and end up as a GS-16, and, and which is not true in many, many different fields. Um, a second wonderful thing is that there's virtually no wage discrimination, male against female. Um, because of this system, that as you, as the women in this room know, you're going to get you know 80 cents versus a dollar for a man in many many career fields in America. We're doing our damnedest to overcome it, but we haven't yet. But this doesn't exist in the federal government. Another thing is, um, yeah, I ran a retail business, family business for 45 years, and you get maybe five. It's the dollars. worst thing in the world. He's both a politician and a card yeah, yeah, yeah. The, 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 the two lowest ranked. <laughs> um, so you get Christmas off and New Year's maybe. Uh, but in the federal government, there's a, it's a nice panoply of holidays, um, which, which you, you very much earn. And that the thrift savings plan, 
Um, you know, you, there are 401ks in lots of different industries. The one that shows the greatest return at the lowest cost is the Swift Savings Plan. That, that's a lot. It's the, fe, the federal 401k, the TSP. Did you want to expand, Karen, on benefits? Uh, definitely. So um, just really uh, double down on what um, Representative Byer mentioned, uh, not only retirement. I mean, I wish folks had told me in my 20s to, to start putting towards retirement and a job, you know, they say time is key. Um, and it's a really incredible program. The health benefits are the most comprehensive. Uh, and I would say also that, uh, you know, we're really trying to push, uh, uh, you know, employers to be much more generous around paid leave. So recently we now have incorporated um, paid parental leave, which is not available um, you know, across the board with a lot of companies. And, and, you know, we're really trying to position the federal government going forward um, as a model employer. So it's not only what we've done well, how we think about the entire individual, it's about how we need to be setting trends um, in the employment sector uh, around really good workplace policies. And I think the paid parental leave is a perfect example of that. I know there are efforts to expand that. Um, uh, to really cover uh, sick leave for a greater portion um, of, of family members um, in a time of need. I'll also say, you know, I know we've been debating a little bit about pay, and, and certainly it's maybe not as competitive as some of the really lucrative careers, but it is a good paying job, and there are, there are efforts, um, and, and there frankly are special pay rates and special pay for certain positions in federal government. If you're in STEM, if you're focused on cyber, you can get paid very well in the federal government. So, and, and the part of what I really enjoy um, um, when I'm talking to folks who actually go in and out, so we're also just trying to make it a lot easier that, you know, we realize people aren't going to come in um, and stay in one career and one job for like 30, 40 years. We realize that that phase of employment has gone. We want you to feel more mobile um, to move in and out of the federal government, get your experience in the private sector, bring it back to the federal government, get your experience in the federal government, bring, take it back to the private sector. But I'll tell you a lot of folks, a lot of technologists, when they come in, they feel like they're working on very impactful stuff. You've recently heard the president talk about this whole effort around the national um, infrastructure in this country, around cybersecurity. The federal government is seeking to lead that. We've got efforts to bring in early career technologists um, into the federal government. There's just a lot of interesting work that, at the end of the day, dollar for dollar, like, yeah, you may be making 10, 15,000 more somewhere else, but think about like the impactful work you're doing. And also I'll just say, we're leaning more into remote and telework. So I think during this pandemic, we realized that you can get a lot, a lot of work done at home. We're also hearing from our employees uh, that they don't necessarily want to be in the office every day. I mean, I, you know, again, I don't know what your commute is like to school. Hopefully you're doing a mix of online and in-person classes, but um, I think we really, for us to stay competitive, we know that we need to lean into that a lot more. And also, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, Karen, but a lot of the benefits like the pension program, if you leave federal service and then return, you know, you, you start right where, where you left off. off. You, you, it, you, you don't lose it. Um, and I think that's a really important thing. And, and Karen also mentioned the uh, uh, the federal health employment program. It is the largest health care insurance program in the world. Um, and uh, I think it's got eight or nine million beneficiaries yes. now, something like that. Uh, and uh, it, it offers a huge cafeteria of programs. Um, 275 plans. 275 plans. You get to choose what's best for you and your family. And every year there's an open season, you can change that if you wish. Uh, and so, uh, and I, you know, even with federal retirees, I do an annual program just to go over the, you know, what's available and what are your best choices and so forth. And hundreds of people participate uh, in this area. Uh, and that's a huge benefit, even after your federal service in terms of retirement. Um, we Let's get on to the second, challenge here though how do we attract and recruit the workforce of the future how do we how do we try to make sure a whole bunch of gmu students decide to elect uh federal service as part of their career or or their career um and i, I just want to repeat two statistics 
that uh, is radically different than the private sector. 8% of the federal workforce is under the age of 30. It's four times that in the private sector and 29% are over 55. So we've got this imbalance that means we're, we're gonna have to recruit hundreds of thousands of federal workers in the next several years. Uh, and we've got to broaden our ability. And I think that means more flexibility, uh, both in hiring practices and in, uh, and in workplace rules. We've got to be less juridical, more flexible, if we're going to appeal to younger generations. Your comment, Madam Director. Can I ask how many of you all have done um, or doing internships right now? Some? Have any done with the federal with the federal agency, or just I'm just saying generally, have any of you all done, done with, uh, just okay? Yeah, so quite a few, right? Where okay, did you, where did you I interned in the office of Congressman Connolly. <laughs> <laughs> did you plant that? And the work and the workplace is perfect, right? <laughs> that doesn't count. <laughs> where did you work? What agency? I worked in Congress and the woman. Uh, Alma Adams. So you also worked in the yeah. health. Okay. okay. And I also was the legislative associate right. on the telecommunications. So we should say uh, yes. uh, that working on the Hill is totally different than than other kinds of federal service. Um, and uh, it, you know, we, we like to think it's glorious, uh, but federal employment is subject to rules we're not subject to. We have more flexibility, especially on internships. Sure. Yes, yeah, so I was speaking specifically about federal agencies. So a lot of them do have um, intern programs for high school students, for uh, college students, for graduate students. Um, it's a program called Pathways. I don't know if, um, if you go onto USA Jobs, if you just do a search that says Pathways, it will pull up um, pretty much the programs that are throughout government uh, um, that are part of the Pathways program. And they were set up in a way to be like a training ground um, for you to get a permanent position in the federal government. They're, they're fairly good paying jobs for being a student. And I will tell you, we're doing even more. So we just passed a regulation for our policy folks, uh, just moved a regulation that actually expands opportunities for agencies to bring in uh, post-secondary students. And what's really great about this is it gives them a lot of different opportunities, not just through the Pathways program, but um, as a little teaser, you know, it actually moves up the potential for pay in the federal government. So you can, you can earn up to a GS-11 as a student, which is 72,000 a year. So depending on your hours and how much, you know, your experience is and the kind of job, you, I mean, that's really good money to be in school, paying for bills, um, you know, circumventing um, any more loans that you might have. And so I do think that we're really trying to think long and hard um, about how we make it a lot easier. You're right, Chairman Connolly. Like we are facing significant retirement numbers. Uh, we need more of you and your colleagues um, coming into the federal government. We need a diversity of experiences and that in includes the younger generation, those early um, in their careers. I will say also that have those of you heard of the public service, um, uh, the public service loan forgiveness program, right? Okay, I wish I had that when I was in, um, in, in the Department of Justice and, and I also worked for a member of Congress. It's a really amazing program. So, you know, I had loans that I had to pay back on my own, but this, you know, you work and you commit over a number of years to, you know, to really um, have the benefit of a loan forgiveness. So I do think, you know, coupled with uh, the opportunities uh, that are in the federal government, as well as some of the benefits and the loan forgiveness is one of them, um, working in the public interest. Uh, but I, you know, Chairman, you're right. I think uh, there's a lot more that we can and should be doing. I think, uh, and I really appreciate the thinking and work that you've been doing with your staff is how we um, really create much more um, streamlined pathways uh, into the federal government. So it's not like a maze for all of you to figure out which agency will I be interested in? Which program is the right program for me? Um, and certainly we're gonna talk a little bit about that as well. And, and I, I know Don wants to come in as yeah. well, but just one part of that, Karen, I wonder if you could address. Okay, sure. So before you took over, mm -hmm. 
it, I think the average time to get a job offer to actually get hired took like 98 days. In the private sector, how long did it take you to hire somebody in your firm? To sell cars a day, you know. They had a pulse in the driver's license. So, <laughs> so I served in the private sector for 20 years. I was hired by two major research companies. Uh, I was the vice president. I was, a, I was a corporate officer of both of them. I was hired in a matter of two weeks. Uh, 98 days is way too long and discourages. Yeah. And I think you've got it down to maybe 59 days, something like that now on average. But how do we get into a more manageable thing so people have predictability in their lives, they can start planning, and that's the option they elect? No, I, um, I, uh, I feel you on that. I, um, I know there, especially as you're planning what you're, uh, uh, what you're thinking about as your career when you graduate, um, I would say definitely start to think early. Uh, the federal government, uh, you know, is we are working to improve that timeline. Um, certainly agencies are very cognizant of that. We've got a number of efforts internally. Um, those of you who really get kind of geeky about um, some policy issues. I'm happy to share with you some of those ideas uh, where we're trying to streamline, where, you know, just sort of think about the scale. Okay, so the federal government we're talking about outside of the Postal Service is more than 2 million people across the country. We are the largest employer in this country. Every agency is like a massive company in this country. Um, and so they have tons of positions. Um, in many ways, sometimes they talk about, you know, the Department of Commerce, as an example, is a subsidiary for all the different functions within commerce that includes so many different areas. So I do think it is a mix of both um, where we can start to not only we're talking about the streamlining around internships, just the, the streamlining around hiring. We're looking at, you know, there are very similar jobs in IRS that there might be at the Department of Commerce. We're trying to basically encourage agencies to post those positions and use the same candidate list, right? So let's say you get 200 individuals on that candidate list, you can all pick from that particular list. I think, you know, one thing that I want to emphasize about the federal government that is the, that is the push and pull is that uh, there is a strong emphasis on merit system principles. And what we mean by that is the federal government prides itself in having a very equitable process. There is, you know, a, a process for how um, resumes are reviewed, how, how the candidate list is put together, um, how the selection process, what the, the panel of hiring managers looks like, because they want to make sure it's a fair process. Now, are there ways to improve that along the way? Um, and do sometimes we get a little caught up in a lot of the rules? That is certainly true. But we're working to, you know, um, really educate um, a lot of our um, HR specialists across the federal government and the Office of Personal Management um, under this president's leadership and my leadership is really working on doing um, some major what we call surge hiring. We have to, this is, this is actually the moment to come into the federal government. There is a lot of hiring going on um, for a lot of great, for a lot of good reasons. Some, you know, some very challenging issue, issues like climate change, but we're also in a phase of rebuilding a lot of these agencies. Just real briefly, um, number one, the student loan payoff is a terrific thing. Mm -hmm. Um, I, I've, it's, it's the best retention tool we have. <laughs> it's been so much fun in the seven years I've been in Congress to see all the young people whose student loans have gone away because of this program. Um, by the way, when it gets paid off, they start looking for another job. <laughs> but, um, the, the second thing is, I, Karen, I'm so glad that you're working to make these internships um, much more compact. I know 10 years ago at State, it took 10, a year to get a, an intern set up which doesn't work for so many people. And same with USA Jobs, that all, everything you're doing to make it that more intuitive, more user-friendly, make it easy for the great young people in this room to be able to access the job that they want. And we're gonna come back to internships because I, I think that's a really important way of actually recruiting mm -hmm. if we use it well. Um, our next topic is diversity, equity, and inclusion. Um, in many ways, the federal employment has been a portal for a lot of folks to move up the economic ladder, to find economic opportunity. Karen mentioned 
It, it was even designed to help bolster uh, a middle class for people who started out somewhere else, lower down on the economic rung. Um, and it provided job security, it provided opportunity, and it provided people uh, the chance to raise a family and, and live a middle-class life um, uh, with security after they retire. Uh, so what are we doing now to address diversity, equity, and inclusion with a really heightened sense of that now in the society in which we live, right? We, we're, we're ever more conscious of the need to, uh, to have a workforce that reflects the diversity of America um, and, uh, and gives everybody an opportunity. Silent pause as you remove us. Um, so, you know, uh, I think we've realized more than ever that uh, um, the importance of, um, of, of, of the principles and values around diversity, equity, and inclusion. I, I don't see how you can run a federal government without having you know, employees that represent the amazing diversity in this country and what they bring um, to the work um, inside the federal government. You know, hopefully, if you haven't heard, the president issued um, an executive order this summer that was focused on diversity, equity, inclusion, and accessibility in the federal government. It is the most expansive effort that has happened in the federal government focused on these issues. And OPM has a leadership role um, that we take very seriously. So, you know, you're hearing about a lot of employers and how they are emphasizing what it means to have, um, you know, an equity-centered uh, um, perspective and focus within their company. I know that um, George Mason has now moved forward with its work, um, you know, around equity issues here on the university. It's happening in every institution. I will tell you in um, the federal government, what we see is that it is an acknowledgement um, that for, um, you know, that too many underserved communities have been underrepresented, um, underrepresented in the federal government. And in particular, what I care about deeply is those, um, that diversity at the leadership level. So we can have, you know, like diversity at all ranks, but we also need to have the leadership um, reflect the diversity of this country um, because that's an important, I think that's important Part of recruitment also, you know, you look to see who you're working with, what your environment looks like, who are the leaders in your organization. So just to tell you a couple of things, you know, we're taking a very data-driven approach to this effort. We're doing right now a baseline study across the federal government to see where we rank, what the numbers look like in each agency. And then we're doing kind of across the board how we're trying to update and improve and really promote best practices around HR policies and practices on, on every single level. Um, finally, I do want to emphasize there's a real movement in the federal government um, to ensure a culture of belonging, to embrace gender identity and sexual orientation and the lived experiences and the unique vantage points um, that will enrich our workforce. Um, and then also we're doing a lot of work, you know, in many ways we have, we have led around employment of individuals with disabilities. We can do better. We can continue to set that model um, for the rest of the country. And then finally, there are some very specific efforts that OPM is leading on to really uh, remove barriers for formerly incarcerated individuals to come in um, and be a part of the federal government. So those are just some of the things. And one, I hope you just continue to watch the work that we're doing um, because both we want to learn what's happening more broadly, but also to make sure that we're setting the standard for the rest of the country. Thank you. And just, just to put it in context, currently the federal workforce, 32% uh, of the federal workforce are people of color. 33% of the senior level workforce are people of color and 22.7% of the senior executive service. So as we see retirements and we are aggressively recruiting, we can improve on those statistics uh, and move toward implementing the president's executive order robustly. Don, did you want to did Just one thought. We get the press releases from the White House every day of who, who's been appointed to presidential personnel, and it is the most diverse crew you have ever seen. If you, it's, it's the opposite of being discouraged. 
because this president has lifted up more women and more people of color into not just jobs, but real positions of leadership all across the government. Uh, in fact, a, I believe a strong majority of the president's federal judgeship nominations mm -hmm. are people of color and women. Uh, I mean, the most dramatic uh, change in uh, the makeup of the federal judiciary will occur if he has enough time to get judgeships um, confirmed. So that's, he's, he's being very consistent. Including promising with, when he, if he ever gets a Supreme Court nominee, it will be a woman of color. Yeah, this will be the first judge. Um, let's talk about telework. Um, I, one of my first bills when I got to Congress was a telework bill that President Obama signed, and I even have a picture of him mm -hmm. signing it in the Oval Office with him. Um, and it was to encourage federal agencies to do more by well of telework. The, the problem with the bill, and I tried, but I couldn't get it, um, we didn't have metrics. We, we weren't measuring federal agencies to say, your goal is, you know, 30% of the eligible workforce, you know, teleworking. Uh, and, and telework is not, well, I feel like working from home today. Telework is a structured program that is pre-approved and has certain requirements to it. So you can't use it for babysitting or daycare. You got to have a designated part of the home if you're working from home or a remote location. Uh, it's structured and evaluated, and it's two or more days a week. Um, and one of the historical problems we faced, and I've dealt with your predecessors for a long time, and, and one of my great allies was John Barry, if you remember him, uh, at OPM in the uh, uh, early Obama administration. But we got a lot of cultural resistance which is strange to people in this room, given your age. But people of a certain age think, if I can't see you, if you're not in the office, you're at home washing the dog, watching soap operas and eating bowls. You're not working. <laughs> and it's kind of an interesting mentality because in the private sector, you know, I was a manager. Let's say your job was to write grant proposals. If you had an 80% hit rate, I don't care if you're at home, you know, upside down in your pajamas. <laughs> All I care about is that 80% success rate. Keep on doing what you're doing. I don't care if you don't come to work. I care about that bottom line. Now, not every job lends itself to that, but it is a mentality. The pandemic has blown that mentality completely apart. I mean, we, we didn't have the luxury of saying, well, I don't know, I'm reluctant. Uh, everyone had to be able to telework. We just didn't have a choice. And guess what? It worked. So. Where are we today and, and where do you want to take us uh, in your new role, Karen, uh, at OPM? Definitely, we are we are in a new day. Can I admit, um, Chairman Connolly, I was one of those managers who was a little uncertain about like how much we wanted to like all be out of the office working. Uh, and, you know, maybe there's a bit of like what was going to be the productivity, but I think there was also... Um, a mix of wanting all to come together and kind of have that collaboration and sort of um, camaraderie. And so I think that's also the real balance here too, I think is that um, there is definitely uh, for a lot of managers like me where that whole idea of like, you were not gonna be able to work successfully um, and, and, and really be productive um, from home is just, is, is, a, is, a, is a completely different ball game. And so we are seeing actually productivity numbers are high. The, and, and employee satisfaction. So we know um, actually people will equate whether you can telework and remote work to like quantifying how much they would take as a pay cut for a job that would allow them to do that um, versus one that didn't. And so those are like real dollars. And so I think, you know, my uh, my plan and my view, of course, in uh, partnership with all of you on the Hill and also across the agencies is to really lean into telework. Um, there are actually right now um, some limitations in the law um, of how we might, you know, that we'll need to kind of work through to really make it more expansive. I think you're seeing a lot more agencies uh, um, promote remote work so that we see a difference between telework and remote work where you actually remote work, you have a different duty station than where your office is located. I will tell you, I'm seeing a lot more folks, especially during the pandemic, decide, you know, I'd really like to work kind of off on a lake or somewhere near a beach um, and still do my job. 
And, but I just want a different, you know, kind of surrounding. And so I think we know to stay competitive as the federal government and that, you know, the next generation and many of us, I think, who just realize what's important during the pandemic, that we want the work-life balance, that we want to be able to um, have certain experiences. We want a fulfilling job and we feel that we can, we can get it all in that way. And so why be confined to a specific location? I do think it has some interesting, um, which I'd love to hear both of you, conversations around our federal footprint and what that means for you know, shrinking office size. And, um, but I'll say that I think this herein lies a real opportunity. The one caveat I will say is at the same time that we had a significant number of folks in the federal government teleworking, we also had a lot of folks who were still on the front lines. Um, you know, actually more than 50% were still very much having to show up for work. Folks in TSA, you know, um, our inspectors going out to uh, um, different factories. I mean, so, you know, there are those jobs in government that will inherently be, um, you know, a mix of having to, to show up um, and, and do the work in person. So, but I'd be curious kind of your thoughts. Well, it, it's actually great that you're a convert. Mm-hmm. Uh, yes, you have exactly. some skepticism, which is, is very common. And, and, but your experience tells you something different, and that's great. Don, did you want to comment? I just want to say, I, when I look at my calendar to find a day when I'm working from home, I think this is great. I don't have to shave. I don't have to take a shower. I don't have to put on pants. <laughs> uh, I am going to get so much done. I disapprove uh, of that for the record. <laughs> <laughs> and, it, and those are the most productive days for me. Um, and, and by the way, we do have to work really closely with the James Walkinshaws, the local government, because people are concerned about getting Metro back up to speed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's um, what, what you're referring to. On the other hand, every outdoor cafe that I know yeah. is filled with federal government workers sitting outside drinking coffee and working all day long. It's very happy. Well, again, focusing on work product and outcomes is far more important than how many hours a day are you physically in the office. And that's the mentality we've got to get away from. Because that's the rules-based juridical approach. The FaceTime. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, clock in your hours. Mm-hmm. No, tell me the quality of your work. And is it making a difference? And that's more important. And, and we've got to make that shift from a, in, in terms of mentality. But I think we're doing it. I think you all are going to be a force for change. Yes. Because we talked earlier about recruitment. That's what's going to have to drive this change. Uh, away from a more rules-based, rigid set of requirements to something much more flexible that takes advantage of technology and, and looks at overall productivity uh, on behalf of the American taxpayer and citizen. Um, so we're coming up on maybe our last yep. major topic, mm-hmm. uh, and, uh, and that is uh, internships. So I'll give you an example, if I can set the stage. This is not something, I think it's instructive that not one of you in this room yeah has interned or even as maybe planning to intern. I thought I saw. For a federal agency. No, 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 no. Well, oh, really? <laughs> you were quiet. <laughs> All right. Okay, good, good. But, but, it kind of <laughs> highlights. Yeah, no, yeah, yeah, exactly. So, you know, someone close to me, when she was at uh, a Virginia university, uh, managed to participate in a competitive process to be considered to be an intern for Deloitte. It was considered like the creme de la creme. You know, if you got into that, oh my God. And and they treated you right. And you have one of the most extraordinary experiences you're going to have for summer. They flew you down to Deloitte University to be oriented and trained. You developed an esprit de corps, and there was a 96% chance if you were an intern for Deloitte, they made a job out. And there was almost a 96% chance you took that job. It was the perfect recruitment mechanism for Deloitte. In the private sector, we're looking at... uh, going from being an intern to being an employee in the high double digits. In the federal government, it's in the single digits. We have failed utterly at use, at, at constructing an internship opportunity that serves for recruitment. And as we talked a little bit earlier about the recruitment challenge the federal government faces, we can't afford that any longer. 
We have to use internships in a much more robust way to fill our recruitment needs. And that gives us an opportunity to get creative, to make it exciting, uh, and to make sure that it's structured in a way that it's a fulfilling experience for those who decide to enter. Um, and so that's the stage I wanted to set. I've got legislation that would move us along and we're gonna work with Karen and her colleagues at OPM to try to uh, fashion it in a way that's uh, mutually acceptable. Uh, but Karen, maybe, you know, coming in from your perspective, where are we in federal internships and what do we need to do to make it better? Yeah. And this is going to be an area when, you know, Chairman, when I came in um, and, and looking at kind of what were going to be my priorities, um, I've already shared uh, with my political team and, and folks in the agency that we absolutely need to focus on early career talent, uh, that we are facing a significant uh retirement wave. I think they're all hanging around because of the pandemic and they get to work from home. So that's good for us um, in that case. But, you know, I do think folks are thinking about um, retirement and, and certainly we want to not only treasure that institutional knowledge, but also make sure that we are passing along everything that they've gained in their roles. I will say that, you know, there are certain programs in place. Uh, the challenge of being such a, a major employer with so many employees there is work oh, yeah. um, that we can be doing um, to really make uh, those opportunities more accessible to you, uh, really investing in the internship programs in the agencies. And I think for you, um, Chairman, as you think about uh, what's the standard, right, of, of how these internship programs should be operating, there's some really great ones and others where there just has not been the level of investment in time um, within that agency to do so. And that's for lots of different reasons, you know. The federal government is, uh, you know, we just came, you know, we averted a shutdown uh, last week. Um, there are things that I think sometimes private sector companies don't have to manage and deal with. Um, so sometimes we get busy with certain things like making sure we can close down an agency properly if we no longer have funds. So I think, you know, there are there, there's a certain environment that makes the government unique, that makes it more challenging, which also makes it more rewarding. Um, and we just have to, to balance that. So would love to have Deloitte as like the example wow. as an aspiration. I think there's a there's a lot in between, um, and and certainly I look forward to working with you on those opportunities. And by the way, uh, I'm gonna short circuit this, Wendy, but uh, there is a QR code, and if we can put up a slide, I know, Mr. President, I don't mean to keep you waiting. Mm -hmm. If I could just do this, can we put up the slide? There it is. So there's a QR code also on the seats on the seats and on it's also seat. on the seats in and front on of your you. seats so you can take it with you um for applying for federal employment opportunities but also internship opportunities um and uh on the first page you can click on the links shown to learn more about the specific federal fellowships at the white house or at the US Digital Corps, as well as uh, others. Uh, there, remember that the federal government is this huge amalgam. So just like Alma Adams may have a different set of policies than Don Beyer or me, every federal agency and even divisions within federal agencies, departments within federal agencies have their own policies. So you gotta, you gotta kind of navigate that a little bit um, but uh, hopefully, uh, there are also uh, agency websites that can help you navigate their specific policy and application deadlines and how to do it. Um, and uh, hopefully, you will take advantage of that. Can, can uh, I mention one? Yeah, that of course. Was, I forgot. The Presidential Management Fellows Program is happening right now. The applications are open. It, the due date is October 12th. So if you're about to finish a graduate program or you have or in like the next cycle up until the end of next summer. Um, it's a coveted leadership program to come into the federal government. Um, you go through that process you, and you'll have a job um, uh, when you get out of college through you know, a graduate program. It and doesn't is, it guarantee even an advancement? Yeah, it's yeah. a leadership pipeline. And we have 10% of our senior executive service. So like across the federal government came through this program. So by the way, I think its predecessor was the pre presidential management um, intern? Yes. PMI. Yes, I was PMI. a PMI. Mm -hmm. oh. 
And I had a choice to go work for the Agency for International Development mm -hmm. with a guaranteed, yeah. I think it guaranteed you have to GS-12 or something. Mm -hmm. uh, or I had a chance for a six month uh, consultancy with a young Senator from Delaware named Joseph R. Biden Jr. <laughs> I looked at the two opportunities, career path in the federal or this chance in the Hill with this young Senator yeah. and I took the Hill. <laughs> So it worked out. It worked out. So <laughs> did you want to talk a little bit about internships? And then we'll go to the press. I don't know whatever happened to that senator. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. I don't know. Yeah, yeah. The, the only thing I'd like to add is like, I have this wonderful team on Capitol Hill. You know, 10 people in the office on the Hill, another five in the district, and every one of them either interned for me or for another member of Congress. And, and that's where we find our talent. You know, we will have four interns at a time, and it's very usual that we will love one of those four so much we'll decide to keep him or her as long as we can. That's a really great point. I do the same. I mean, almost, I would say most of my staff started out as interns and many of them have been with me for 10 or 12 years for almost the entirety of the time I've been in Congress. So we, we, you, we do use internships to recruit talent uh, and would love to see that um, replicated in a big way by the federal government. Mr. President, I didn't mean to keep you waiting. I'm sorry, we just wanted to finish this one topic. Over to you. Well, thank you. Well, two things. Uh, first and foremost, I want to give time for at least one or two questions. Oh, yeah. I know you all have questions as students, and we want to provide an opportunity to ask them. So, got time for a couple of people. Who? There we go, right here. Right here. And if you just tell us who you are, and if you'd like, where are you from? Sure. My name is Zaid. I'm from McLean, from the 11th District. First of all, thank you all for being here, and thank you for the great work that you do. I'm a sophomore majoring in cybersecurity engineering at Mesa. Um, so we heard a lot today about what the federal government is trying to do to recruit the next generation. I would be interested to hear from all of you on what we can do, uh, especially in our younger years, to prepare for a job or for an internship in the future with the federal government. Great question. Karen, what are we looking for in terms of quality of new federal employees who are in university? That's a great question. I mean, like, yeah. what, what, what skills, what academic credentials should I be developing or looking at? Yeah, I mean, there are definitely what we're defining as like mission critical skills and a skills gap in the federal government. You are in the right line of work. Um, so, uh, but I would say any of the STEM fields. Um, but you know, when I'm talking to leadership in these agencies, they need more economists, they need, they need more project managers, um, they need more policy, um, folks focused on policy. I mean, it is literally every conceivable occupation. Um, that's what, you know, that's the need because it is, the government is so vast. And so I think as you're thinking about like, you know, where you want your, you know, your first career, or your next career. Um, you know, we've talked a lot about how streamlining and making things a bit easier. So I, I would guess not to necessarily put the burden on all of you, but as we work to improve like the accessibility and making things more um, just user friendly, um, you know, spend time on the USA jobs, look to see even as you're like, maybe not ready to look for a job, but look at the salaries, look at the, the job description, the responsibilities, see what speaks to you, um, because there are a lot of opportunities out there. Um, I would also say, um, you know, especially for something like the President, Presidential Management Fellows Program, which is pretty competitive, um, we're looking for strong leadership skills, communication skills, um, writing is a big priority now, um, uh, mostly in any sector, but especially in government. Uh, so, you know, those would just be a few things that I could point to, but other other than also to say you're you're definitely on the right track with your with your career. I we'll take we'll take one more. Can I can I, I just want to add to that? Uh, uh, I I think unless you're going to be like a basic research scientist at a lab bench trying to develop the next generation of antibiotics, that we need you to be really in depth there. And I don't care too much about other skills. But if you're gonna kind of you know. Uh, navigate the federal waterfront. What I really am looking for personally is flexibility and management skills. 
that you, you've got a skill in motivating people and listening to them, but also in being flexible. I, what we don't need more of is rules-based, rigid thinking. You know, rule number 41-6, appendix 18 in volume 41, it makes it very clear. We can't do something. Well, okay, but how does that help anybody? Uh, we, we need people who can figure out how to solve problems uh, and stay flexibly mentally and have a versatility and being able to move around maybe an agency to bring that skill set to bear on something that's not performing as well as the division you just left. So for me, speaking for me, that those are the skill sets I'm looking for. Problem solvers. Yeah, problem solvers. And, and that there may be many academic fields that allow you to pursue that with a specialty too. But, um, you know, I got my master's at... University up north uh, in uh, uh, public uh, administration. And I can tell you that degree really helped. I mean, I, I helped run Fairfax County, a county of 1.1 million people. But it's one of the largest local governments in America, one of the most successful, five and a half billion dollar a year budget, you know, a, a huge workforce, the largest workforce in Virginia, by the way. Uh, and uh, I can tell you that the, the skills I developed and the, and, and, and the exposure to management challenges through issues, uh, I experienced served me well. So that's certainly one academic path, not the only one, but certainly one that I, I find useful. Did okay. you want to comment on another? Just, just, just very quickly, you know, the, the most basic law of marketing is differentiate or die. What makes you different from the next guy? So when I'm reading resumes, I'm always looking for that one surprise. You know, the, the fact that you play the bagpipes or you work, mm -hmm. through, you, you work at the homeless shelter or you decided to be a priest. And that changes everything because there's one thing that jumps out. Oh, good. So you you make room for us, Catholics. Yes, sir. <laughs> right, right. He's an Episcopalian. Um, Hi. Hi. So, <laughs> uh, my name is Ryan Roy. Uh, I live in Long County, Virginia, and I'm a... MPA student here at Mason. Uh, can I ask you to speak up because I can't hear yeah, you. I'm not sure if this works. Did it's, you it's say Los Angeles? No. Um, my, my name is Ryan Maroy. I live in Loudoun County, Virginia. Oh, Loudoun. Yeah. Um, I'm an MPA student here at Mason. Um, and thank you so much for coming to speak to us today. And especially um, to Director Huja as an Indian American woman, it's always amazing to see other Asian women um, thriving in public service. Um, and I've actually worked in the API field for the past three years. And I'm really looking to transition into more diversity and inclusion roles. Um, and I've been scouring USA Jobs for um, internships at OPM. Um, and I was wondering, will those be released uh, sometime in a couple months? Uh, we'd love to intern there. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> so let's chat afterwards. Um, but we are, one thing that's really great with this, uh, with the new executive order and really just so Love the fact that you'd like to come work for our agency. We are taking a leadership role in the work we're doing around DEI across the federal government. But one thing that's being proposed in the executive order, which uh, you know is really up to the agencies, is actually designating a chief diversity officer in the senior uh, at the senior levels of each agency. Right, so someone at the senior level who's really making it their responsibility on behalf of the executive um, to really focus on. Um, on these issues, um, just because it is a priority for this administration, but we also know it's also going to set us up for success. So I look forward to chatting with you afterwards. Mr. President, would you allow us to take just two more? <laughs> well, we can definitely, yeah, sure. Thank you. <laughs> I, I just hate to have all these students and, and only have two questions. So if, if you would allow There's us. There's one right here. Okay. Yeah. Thank you very much. Um, my name is Jenna Madelon. I am a finance student here at Mason. Um, this is piggybacking off of his question just a little bit. Um, and I'm pulling this a little bit from your previous discussion, as well as this report here to the president and to Congress um, from the U.S. Merit Systems Protection Board. And it states here that federal entry level new hires and professional and administrative positions are not the young, ex inexperienced, recent college graduates that many expect. On average, they are 33 years old and have at least one to five years of prior full-time work experience. So 
my question to you, piggybacking off of what he was asking in regards of what we can do to stand out, how much emphasis do you put on a master's degree? And do you feel like that's something that makes a, a big enough difference to, to value getting that additional education if we're looking to work in the federal service? Well, I, I'll just tell you my own prejudice. Uh, I mean, an academic degree is nice to have. It's not essential. And I would never, uh, I would never use that as a screen when I'm hiring. And I would discourage it in the federal place too. First of all, uh, there are a lot of sort of people who can use the federal government as an entry level portal for employment. And they can get an advanced degree as they think they need it in federal service with some help, yeah. by the way. So, so you may not, you know, everyone's different, right? Like you may not yet be ready to decide on what a graduate degree, if I need one at all, ought to be. And you want some experience before you make that decision. That's a very wise thing. Uh, I was a mid-career MPA. I was in my late 20s. Um, and I'm glad I waited because I had more clarity about where I wanted to go. You know, in, early, in your early career, you, you might want to experiment a little bit. And you should, if you can. Because, uh, you know, maybe you're good at something you didn't think you'd be good at. Or you discover... I love this work and it would never occur to me I might. Or serendipity occurs and you know opportunity drops in your head that you didn't anticipate. So letting life kind of work a little bit, I think is very important and life experience is very important. So I, I may get somebody who's got all the academic credentials in the world and hasn't got an ounce of common sense. And, and the person with life experience who doesn't have that degree, that's the person I want running the operation because they know what they're doing. So you got to stay flexible. And I think rigid rules about academic degrees hinder our ability to spot talent and promote it. Thank you. And I would just say like right now, we're reviewing a lot of occupations to move towards skills-based hiring and removing the college degree requirement. Sorry, President Washington. <laughs> but, um, but a combination, right? If you have that degree, great. But to the chairman's point, you know, uh, we are really looking for those appropriate skills. It's actually really relevant in the tech cyberspace because people aren't necessarily getting their degrees, they're learning on the job. Um, and then also I just mentioned pathways, put it the search term in the USA jobs. It is a pathway into coming in as a student, getting uh, experience, maybe coming a permanent employee, having the federal government provide you tuition reimbursement. I mean, there's lots of different ways to think about that. So I really appreciate the question. Thank you. I, want, I once had the best advice I ever heard of President Washington about hiring personnel. Uh, I, I was talking to somebody who was the head of cardiology at St. Luke's Presbyterian Hospital in Chicago and very prestigious job, you know, oh my God. And I said, what's the secret, you know, to run in this department? He said, two pieces of advice. Number one, learn how to recognize talent. And number two, learn how to live with it. <laughs> Hello, my name is Fania Lampere. You're going to have to speak up. Uh, my name is Fania Lampere. No, no, it, it, you can use the mic, but you're, you're soft-spoken, and I'm way up here. It's not my hearing. <laughs> <laughs> uh, my name is Fania Lampere. I'm from Fairfax, Virginia. I'm currently a freshman studying global affairs with a concentration in European and minor in French. Um, I would love to intern for the federal government specifically for you. So I was wondering- Are um, you a constituent? <laughs> where do you live? Fairfax, Virginia. Uh -huh. Fairfax, yes. where? In Fairfax City. Fairfax City, yes. so you're a constituent. <laughs> God bless you. <laughs> um, so I was wondering how can one prove that they foster the skills you're looking for? And how do you specifically uh, select interns? How do I select interns? Yeah. yeah. Um, so, um, good question. First of all, we try to look if you're a constituent because we're, you know, I've got almost 800,000 constituents. I try first to look at my own community to see if I can give as many young people an opportunity as possible. We have some rules. I will not accept high school interns. They can, they can intern for my campaign, 
but not, it's just too difficult. We have too many college applicants, you know, that's a big talent. Uh, we look for diversity, we look for, we look for, uh, we look for people who really could benefit bigly from <laughs> this opportunity. I, I, I'm trying to be delicate in how to say it. I, if you come from a really privileged family already, you know, you've had every privilege and all that. There are other families that don't have that and an internship in the hill would really be a big deal. So we kind of look to see if, if there's that opportunity. We don't discriminate, but you know, um, we want to look at motivation. Now this is just checking a box or your parents really want you to do it. You're a low priority because we want people who are motivated, who share our, our passion for public service. And we try to structure the program so that when you leave, you will be saying to people, I had a great experience. You spent face time with a member. I mean, I, I know people, I, I had someone who worked for me who interned for a member of Congress, never met the Congresswoman. I'm thinking, what? I mean, first of all, you know, our offices are small, so that, that's hard to do. Um, but the fact that the member of Congress didn't think it was important enough to interact with you as an intern, because every intern who leaves my office is potentially an ambassador for me, right? I mean, and but I want it to be an enriching experience because I'm committed to what Karen is committed to. I'm hoping you might think about public service in some fashion at some point, maybe a career, maybe at least some point in your life. And so I have an obligation to make this as important and meaningful an experience to you. So we don't just, you know, they do everything, right? They, they go to hearings, they write memos, they answer the phones, they do research, they spend time with me where I'll explain what this vote that's coming up and I'll, I'll even solicit, well, how do you think it should vote? What do you think should be the factors that weigh, I weigh in trying to decide yes or no on a particular vote? And and my other mission, then I'll shut up, but my other mission is to try to make sure every intern who interns for me leaves far less cynical about government than they enter. <laughs> because at least in my office, what you will learn is politics play very little role in my decision-making about how to vote. Politics are an afterthought. So once we've decided on the merits, here's how we're gonna vote on this big issue or whatever. Then we figure out, uh-oh, How's that going to play at George Mason University? You know, uh, but but that doesn't determine how I vote. We manage that. So all of that's a way of saying we, we try to make sure it's an enriching experience and you can apply. I think it's online, isn't it? Um, how, how to apply for an internship? On our website. On our website, yeah. So you can go on the website uh, and uh, we take everyone seriously and we try to accommodate as many as we can. I know right. you're going to have a good internship with someone who's promoting internships across the federal government. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah I've, I've got to practice yeah, what yeah, I preach. Exactly. exactly. <laughs> well, will you all please give uh, Congressman Conley and Director Kim a hand job round of applause? Thank you, Kim. As a token of our appreciation for you coming here today, we have a couple of gifts for you. This is some Mason honey from our apiary. Oh, we, you didn't know we had an apiary on campus. I didn't know. Yeah. These are flying all around here. Thank God. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all. And thank you all for coming. Keep up the fight. <laughs> Oh, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>